So your question was, what was it? Oh, 64? Let me, I'm rebooting here. So we have z plus 1 squared, r is a triangular region with vertices 0, i, and 2. Find the points on r, or in r, where the modulus of f of z is minimized or maximized. If possible, use a theorem from complex analysis. Yeah. So you're, you're thinking the maximum principle? Yeah. Right. Okay, so then I guess my question sort of is, is there like a very specific way to do it, or I just kind of said like, See here, where, where was that? I just want to review right quick. It was 8.5. Oh, I wrote it down. 8.5. Oh, there we go. So let h of z be a complex valued harmonic function on a bounded domain d such that h of z extends continuously to the boundary. Um, That says if there's a maximum, it must be. What's that say? <laughs> if you go down to the next page, okay. So if the maximum modulus was attained in the interior of D, then we have that the modulus of the function over the domain is just constant at M. And by continuity, the extension of H to the boundary modulus of the boundary is also the constant value. Max, maximum modulus of H of Z is always attained on the boundary given the continuous. All right, so yeah, um, going back to our pro your homework problem. So, I mean, have we met the conditions? It's come. Yeah. yeah. Basically, my question is I've done it by just checking the three sides of the triangle. Uh huh. And looking at them and saying, well, you can tell from this that the maximum modulus is zero. Yeah. Is that all you have to do, or is it Well, what would the minimum? Of what did the minimum do at zero? Okay, so. And there's no negative in the region. Uh, hmm. Oh, you mean we can't get to the, we can't get the z equals minus one? Yeah. Oh. Poor planning on my part. I think I meant for it to be in there, but my stupid logic was that uh, I was like, I had one, <laughs> right? And I had 0 and 2. I was like, well, 1 is between 0 and 2, so that should be, but, duh. Right? Be at minus, Z minus 1 would have been more exciting, right? Um, huh. But yeah, you can just, I think that's, the, that's probably the way I would do it. Just look at, I mean, you can parameterize each leg if you want to be more careful. You can find parameterization of the, you don't even need to do that when you look at it? No. No. Well, but I don't know. I mean, z z plus one is x plus i x plus one plus i y. So the modulus of z plus one is the square root of x plus one squared plus y squared, right? So the modulus of z plus one. <laughs> this is kind of funny. I mean, it's kind of funny. I never actually had the square z plus 1. Right. You know? I mean, we'd, we'd come to the same answer. It's not, like, it's not like squaring z plus 1 is really such a laborious task anyway, but... So you're saying that the... That, so this, this is the modulus we're trying to maximize. What's a triangle look like? 0, i, and 2? 
zero i two So we got to check these three legs here. I mean, I mean, yeah, x plus one squared is largest when x equals to two, but when y is non-zero, that's also making this larger, right? I mean. I mean, I agree with you. It probably, too, is the, uh... oh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's a direct geometric argument you could make here, right? Do you see why you don't need to use calculus for this problem? Right. Are you, but are you keeping in mind that this is the distance? From, you know, minus one to x plus i y. I mean, distance squared. So <laughs> if you notice that, um, So if we look at the triangle, then we ask, you know, where is the distance squared from minus 1, comma 0 in the plane largest? Then your answer is eminently reasonable, right? I mean, and you can also see from that geometric argument why 0 is the minimum, because the closest, I mean, the circle And then that's the, the furthest circle out, which hits the triangle. So in this case, it looks like the maximum and the minimum are attained on the boundary. Hmm. It's funny. I'm sorry, I, I, should, have, I should have come up with a, a, a complex function which was more complicated. So you would have been forced to do calculus on the boundary or something. My, my example here is just kind of boring. I, just, I wanted to give you guys something where you'd have a chance to think about the maximum modulus result for a problem. So this is, this is what I came up with. But I don't think it's a great problem. For one thing, I can solve it without even lifting a finger of, like, not even multivariate calculus, much less complex analysis, right? I mean, I can just look at the modulus of z plus 1 squared and go, it's the distance from minus 1 to the point. So picture, minimum, maximum, done, right? Now, maybe Sam wouldn't accept that as a proof. I don't know. How, you, you, have you, you've talked to Sam a fair amount, Jonathan. How does he feel about geometric proofs? Uh, he likes them for intuition, but he likes them for Oh, okay. Oh, that's... I would agree with that posture. I think for intuition, they're great for... You know, for a careful proof, it's worrisome, yeah. Although sometimes things are just obvious enough that it's kind of the end of the... I think this is one where... But anyway. So let, let's move past this problem. <laughs> I was just checking. You didn't want anything like... No. I don't know what the right word is. Like, rigorous, and I think that's no. the answer. No. It's not warranted here. I've asked harder problems in Calculus 3. My apologies.
So you have a question, Jonathan? Or are you just here for the ambiance? So you want to do like one over a power series and like finding the principal part? Yeah, so we have like, okay. so we have like a power series or a geometric series of the sum is one over one minus some sum series in and of itself. How to represent that as a geometric series. Let's see here. Try something. One over, let's say, um, z minus z squared plus z cubed minus z to the fourth plus dot. We'll, we'll start out with this example. If it doesn't suit what you're asking for, we'll do something else, okay? Um, so, you know, looking at, so I'm thinking of this as being my, 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 you know, one over sine kind of thing. Yeah. Now that, I can do what? I could, I can factor out a one over z, right? And, that's going to give you one minus z plus z squared minus z cubed, right? But um, for appropriate, if the, uh, if the modulus of z is less than 1, you know, for modulus of z less than 1, I can replace this with what? With 1 over 1 plus z, right? Um, let's see here. Then what would happen? Uh, then that would give me 1 plus z over z, which would give me 1 over z plus 1. So apparently, the function we're looking at um, has a simple pole at 0. And I suppose that would also be true. Yeah, this would be, I mean, apparently a rational function. Yeah, yeah. You're asking if this is the p infinity of z in my earlier language. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. The Liam approach is how should I proceed? I, on, uh, I can throw my coffee at him. What's that? Uh-oh. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Oh yeah, what he's doing there is he's just. Um, I know what you're talking about. I mean, we can look. We can look at that for a second.
This one, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I think this is Rob John, whoever that is. Um, say so 1 over sine z, z over sine z. Of course, doing that makes this into, this. once he does that, z over sine d, has, z over sine z has a removable singularity at zero, I believe. Um, oh, wait a minute, that's not even true. It's, well, sine z over z has a removable singularity at zero, right? I mean, z over sine z is still very much misbe <laughs> misbehaving. Um, I mean, oh. All right, so I'm sorry. Let me, let me stop trying to say more than I should say. So is this, um, so we're good there? Yeah, that's just sine of z divided by 2x. Right, right. And then he's got the inverse here, which then by magic, he gets to that. So, and then down here, what he's talking about is he's saying that to calculate the inverse of a series, you can look at the Cauchy product and solve the coefficient equations order by order. This is also what I said in class, briefly. Um, so what he's saying is that to find the inverse of this, you can look, so thinking of these as being the A's, A0, da 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 da, and these being the B's, da 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 da. You can find the B's given the A's. You're looking for this to be equal to 1, which means that C0 is, C0 is 1 and CK larger than 0 is 0, which I think is what he wrote down here in a bit. Okay, so that's just like an intuitive process kind of figuring out what you have to place for I would say it is a gory iterative process. Uh, intuition, eh, debatable. Um, so he's just saying that all the C's are 0 except for the first one. And these are the given coefficients for the sine, the reduced sine series. And so, and he's just saying for, through Gori calculation, you can see that, for example, the coefficient of Z8 is given by this. Which, if you've already found out, B0, B2, B6, and B4, you can figure out what B8 is. But he's Hey, by the way, I'm really happy with this example. <laughs> you know, this actually worked out nice. Let's look at the sine z problem, though. Sure. So, what were you saying, Bethany? Well, I, it, I'm pretty sure it worked because I did it that way, and I got the same answer. So, one over sine z, and then what did you do? It was z over sine z. Oh, z over sine z. Okay. And what do we want to do with that? We want to find. So, we, we're, we're, what, what's our? What are we? What are we doing? Trying to find the Laurent expansion centered about zero? Is that it? Mm -hmm. Calculating the power series expansion up to order five. Power series expansion. If we want to do the Laurent expansion, that's what I really like with the graph here. Mm -hmm. Laurent expansion is really around good. what? About what, though? See, because the power series expansion is the Laurent expansion if it's analytic at the point. So the power, like Taylor series, if, it ex if it, we're talking about an ordinary point, a point where the function's analytic, then the Taylor series about that point is the Laurent series, centered at that point. You know, because if the point's not a singularity, then the principal part, part is zero. And so there's no negative terms in the Laurent series. They're not different ideas. Like, the Taylor series is a special case. So, like, the idea of the Laurent series is to expand around points that are singularities so that you have, an ex like you have a way to express it without turning it into problems? Right. It's a way to capture misbehavior of the, of the function in some sense. I mean, we have theorems for holomorphic functions, then we have to kind of capture non-trivial things around singularities by integrals. Or if we have the Laurent expansion around the singularity, it's already 
it's already captured that same integral data. Like, um, I'm not. Hopefully, it will become more clear as we work more with it. But if you don't have a in good intuition for it yet, it's understandable. Um, so, how did you do this one? Uh-huh. Okay. So then you factor it out as Z and cancel them. So you got one minus and then what did you do? And then I good grief. Fourth, right? <laughs> Squared, yeah. The other way we okay, yeah. So the way I taught you guys, one of the ways I taught you guys is just use long division. So we could we could do long division to find the reciprocal series. Oh, I know what I did. I did one minus the rest of it, and then changed blended and came back to weird stuff. Yeah, and that's what I was trying to do in my notes originally. And the thing in my notes is I had an error. I had what I had done was grouped this and put a square outside, which is just crazy. So I, I agree with what you said, Bethany, which is this is this minus, right? And so if you do that, then that, if we think of this as being u, then this is 1 plus u plus u squared, provided that this is less than 1, right? Right, so we have 1 plus 1 sixth z squared minus 1 over 120 z to the fourth, and then plus, well, plus dot dot dot, plus 1 sixth z squared plus 1 over 100, well, minus 1, blah, 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 minus over 1 over 20 z to the fourth, of course, plus dot dot dot, dot squared. Is that, a, is that fair? Um, like the next term is, is things cubed, right? If you think about the, the, the U cubed term, it has terms of what? Of degree 6 to 12, right? Because we're, we're taking, well, for what I've written, but obviously infinitely high order. But I, I think this is the only way you can get terms up to order 4, right? There's no terms of order 4 in the things I've neglected. That's what you've got to watch out for is neglected terms of a particular order. So if we're just going to order 4, I have enough, right? We can do 1 plus 1 sixth z squared minus 1 over 120 z to the fourth plus, and then we got to do some math, 1 over 36 z to the fourth. Um, actually, you know what? Who cares, right? Because if I'm just going to fourth order, that's it. Things I've not written down are sixth order or, or worse yet, eighth order. So collect stuff together and that should be it. Have you guys looked at the page I handed out? Uh, okay. I don't think I have it with me, so I can't talk about it either. <laughs> but you had other questions, Bethany, so let's go on. You know, it's a good question whether or not I even intended for you guys to look at the infinity at zero for that problem. I don't remember right off the top of my head if that's something I'm wanting you to think about. Um, it's something we could think about, right? Is, you know, do, do these functions have a zero at infinity? What would that mean for it to have a zero at infinity?
Uh huh. Right. So then that's the same part to the algebra thing. Well, but zero is a little funny. Well, not. Yeah. Seems like I've okay. kind of ruined zero there. Oh, I said f of zero is minus one half, so I guess I guess it's not a zero, right? I mean. If you said that zero is still a zero, you're just being belligerent, I think, right? <laughs> but my question remains, if you did care about seeing whether or not these functions have zero at infinity, how should you investigate that? Right, we got to look at the, so for part A, we should look at G of W equals to F of one over W which would be what? 1 over w squared plus 4 over 1 over w squared minus 4, which we could probably multiply by, by w squared, perhaps. Just to make life easier. Yeah, I don't think that has a zero at, at zero, does it? No. I think actually, I think actually zero is a, yeah, zero is a removable singularity, in fact, for G. I just removed it by multiplying by w. I mean, technically speaking, for w equal to zero, this algebra I just did is totally bogus, right? But that, that algebra is actually the same algebra that removes the zero from this function. See, because this makes w equal to zero undefined, this w equal to zero, no problem, it's just one over one which corresponds to the fact that that's a rational function, which as z goes to infinity takes value one, leading coefficients being one over one. So the principal part of this is actually one, which is why we're finding that the reduced function here at zero is one. Anyway, in short, part a does not have a zero at infinity. It's actually got a singular, singularity of a removable type, such that when you remove it, its value is one. Um, B, ugh, that's an essential singularity at infinity, so we can't even ask the question of, well, I don't know what we can say. Anyway, it's an essential singularity at infinity, so it's not a zero. Uh, and then that's also an essential singularity. So no, I don't think the question of whether, I think the question of whether or not these functions are zero at infinity is not interesting. Well, I mean, I, I, that's too strong. It's just not what I'm asking about. So then the only zeros from part C are the same zeros as part C, right? Except G is right. Yeah, I think so. Seems too good to be true. Yeah. yeah, I know. Sometimes I slip up and do something nice. I mean, it, it's, I'm working on it. I'm, I will get meaner. Don't worry. I'm, it's, that's the problem with teaching so many classes is it doesn't give me time to be maximally mean to the classes that I have, you know? Oh. Um, so this geometric series trick, though, Jonathan, like, you know, it's got strings attached, right? It's only meaningful for, for this less than one. So I think for z close to zero, that's okay. But I do wonder if z is not close to zero, you know, is this less than one for z not close to zero? Yeah, probably not, right? So it seems like this expansion I'm getting is only going to be legitimate relatively close to zero. And in fact, that makes sense because sine of z has zeros, simple zeros at integer multiples of pi. So what that says is that z over sine z, it's something like 
1 over z minus pi, and then plus or minus 1 over z. Actually, I don't know what the numbers are. Number. Number. I, I just don't know what the numbers are, yeah? Plus. I mean, you can expand. I mean, there's a piece of this z over sine z that looks like a reciprocal in z minus pi because if I'm close enough to pi, pi is a simple pole, which means that close to pi, I can write sine z as what? Something like, you know, h of z over z minus pi, right? And if I'm close enough to minus pi, I can write it as like h2 of z over z plus pi, yeah? And so maybe there's a way of expanding 1 over sine z in terms of like a sum of reciprocals of singularities. If I recall correctly, what's shown in the handout that I gave you guys is that he comes up with a Laurent, like an expression for modulus of, I think, z less than 4. And if I recall correctly, what he shows is that 1 over sine z can be written as something like um, 1 over z plus 1 over z minus pi plus 1 over z plus pi plus some h of z. Now that, that's not, I mean technically that's not a Laurent expansion, right? I mean that's something, well it's, uh, see that, that's the interesting thing about this example is you can, all right, so if this identity is true, and again, I'm not certain about the pluses. There may be a minus in one of these. In the, you got to look at page 173 to 174 of Gamelin, the handout I gave you guys. But I believe he shows there that you can write 1 over sine z is like the sum of these three things. So that, and this is, this is just a whole more analytic on the disk, okay? And I think this expression holds up to the next singularities for 1 over sine z. So like that's good. I think that's good up to like the modulus of z being 2 pi, which is where you hit the plus or minus 2 pi singularities of 1 over sine, which are also simple poles. But the point is, Bethany, that this, while it's not a Laurent expansion, it does give you a clear roadmap to how to find the Laurent expansions around singularities in there, right? Like. To the Laurent expansion around zero, it's got a principal part, of 1 over z, and then this stuff collectively is analytic on some disk around zero. On the other hand, if you wanted to find the Laurent expansion centered around pi, that's the principal part, and this guy and that guy and that guy become analytic. So it, this kind of decomposition of a function into these sum of principal parts around singularities could be very useful for certain questions. So you kind of just see where you're centering it and then choose which part is what's based on like what's analytic and what's not. Yeah, I think so. I think that's mostly we're looking for division by zero and trying to come to terms with how much division by zero we have <laughs> in some sense or another. So if I, if I understand his example correctly, if we wanted to find the similar expression like out to n pi, we'd have like a sum of n reciprocal terms, maybe 2n. You, you always get plus or minus, plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 3 pi. So you, if you added enough of these reciprocal terms in, you could have a sum of those reciprocal terms plus an analytic piece is equal to 1 over sine z. And that, that would give you a representation of 1 over sine z on that, that disk. And that would be useful for answering certain questions. The way he calculates that on page 273 to 274, though, 
kind of neat. But anyway, these, I think these questions are pretty straightforward, right? Like, find each zero in the order for this one. So like, obviously, if you expand, I mean, so that's a, I mean, there's two different things going on. We can use pre-calculus slash stuff we already know about trigonometry to see zeros, right? In order for that to be zero, either z cubed is zero or sine of two z is zero. So z cubed is zero when we're at zero. Sine of two z is zero. Well, we know sine of theta is zero for theta multiple of n pi, and we can kind of go from there. Then to decide the order of the zeros, you gotta look at the derivative and see if the derivative is zero. If the derivative is also zero, it's apparently at least a double zero. The second derivative is also zero, it's at least a triple zero, but eventually you'll hit a derivative that's non-zero because I haven't given you something identically zero. So. Other questions? Right. So like whatever order it is, that number derivative is zero. Correct. Right. So like a simple zero is one for which the derivative at the zero is non-zero. Right. So problem sixty-seven. Uh-huh. You still have to prove they're simple though. I don't think it's clear that when the derivative of sine is non-zero, the derivative of tangent is also non-zero. Although, if you spend more than about a half a page on this, you're working too hard, I think. It's not bad. But interestingly, that also shows that the reciprocal of sine and the reciprocal of tangent have simple poles, those same places. kind of neat. So you got my email about that. Did you? I sent you an email about, was it part A? Okay, okay. And then I was like, oh, that was a really dumb question. <laughs> yeah, I knew you asking that question, it, it gave me a, a window into the fact that you were, you were very confused at that time. Because I knew that you knew that. <laughs> so, so, yeah. But that is good. Not part 871, part 868. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we should find two zeros for that one. And also two poles for what it's worth, although I didn't ask about that. And I suspect that they're both simple poles. Namely, plus and minus two. I believe plus and minus two are simple poles for that. And I, I kind of think that the zeros for that function are also simple zeros. So something funny to think about, if you, were, if you take the reciprocal of it, then two and minus two become simple zeros, and the zeros both become simple poles, I, I, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Sorry, the relation between zeros and poles, it, it amuses me. And so any questions about 71? So that, that, that one is maybe more the kind of thing you're thinking about, Jonathan, where we take a geometric series and plug it into something more hideous. Um, because I would say the way to think about, well, at least the way I would think about part B we're talking about f of z. Mm -hmm. 
So what was you, you, were, you were thinking like exponential of, and this would be what? Right? So it's the sum n equals 0 to infinity, minus 1 to the n, z to the 2n. Right? So you're really looking at like 1 minus z squared plus z to the 4th minus z to the 6th plus dot dot dot, right? And then so there's a way to make this uh, way to make this hard. There's a way to make this easy. If you want it to be hard, just apply the apply the apply the McLaurin series to what you have, right? See, because if this is u, right? McLaurin series for exponential, which we know is 1 plus u plus 1 half u squared, and so forth and so on. Fair enough. You could do that. Now, I forgot what I'm trying to do here anyway. Find the isolated singularities. Ah. Uh, I um, I think it's clear that that function is holomorphic except for two points. What are those points? Very good. Yeah, plus or minus i. So I'm not really solving the problem at the moment. I'm just doing a related calculation. Okay. So sorry for wasting your time, but not too sorry. Now. So this would be foolish because u, u squared, u cubed, they all have constant terms in them. In fact, they all have terms of all orders, almost, as you go up. Right? Because if you throw this 1 into the mix, when you <laughs> cube, when you, you square this, you've got everything here and more. I mean, it's just it's horrible if you include a constant term in the expansion. Like, it's just not a good place to be. You can avoid that. You want to avoid that. So there's a simple way to avoid that. Laws of exponents. See, because this is really 1 plus u. And so I can look at this as, well, let me see over here. Um, sorry. I can look at this as e to the 1 times e to the minus z squared, z to the fourth, minus z to the sixth, right? And so then, this is just e times 1 minus, you know, z squared plus z to the fourth, da da da, um, plus 1 half, of z squared plus z to the fourth plus da 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 dot squared plus da 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 dot. So like if I wanted to take the say fourth order, I've already got everything I need to get all the fourth order terms. Right? Like the fourth order I just have. That's one z to the fourth. There's another one half z to the fourth over here, which gives me three halves. And I think that would be there you go. I think that's at least the up to up to quartic order, the power series expansion of um, one over one plus z squared. I think that's the easiest way I know to find that. Uh, now, if you think of an easier way to find this, to derive this, let me know. Now. You guys, I, I asked, I mean, the, the point is that you're trying to find the expansion where 
about z equals to plus or minus i, right? Those are the singular points for this expression. So oh yeah. <laughs> I just thought of how to do it. <laughs> it's actually somewhat related to what I just did. Think about this. What if you found the partial fractions decomposition for the input to the exponential? Right? In other words, you have 1 over z squared plus 1 equals to blah over z minus i plus yada over z plus i. And then you take about, think about taking the exponential of that. Well, exponential of a sum is the product of the exponentials, right? So that'd be exponential of blah I believe, right, e to the a plus b is e to the a times e to the b. And what, is that, what does that show you about the nature of the singular points plus or minus i for this function? Indeed. I think they're both essential. That's what I'm seeing because when you expand the exponential, you've got 1 plus 1 over z plus i plus 1 half z plus i squared and so forth and so on forever and ever, amen, times an analytic function. I mean, blah over z minus i exponentiated at z equals minus i, that's analytic. So. Right? And it's also non-zero. So there's no, there's no infinity of zeros or, you know, I mean, there's no way that that can somehow cancel out all of the reciprocal terms in the other. So you have to actually multiply them out? You, you, you need to give convincing evidence that the Laurent series contains infinitely many, that the Laurent series has the form of an essential singularity. Or, or, uh, you could, uh, for example, use a theorem that characterizes a isolated singular point as being removable, a pole, or an essential singularity. Classify each type of singularity. What better way to classify the type of singularity than to use the classification theorems that we've gone over, removable, pole of order n, or essential. And so to show that it's an essential singularity, it would suffice to find perhaps sequences which approach plus or minus i, and yet the modulus of that function approach different values. If you could do that, then by the kesselrodi weierstrass theorem, that would prove that it's an essential singularity. I am merely showing you at the moment a beastly direct computational method. So like from where it's at right now, though, would you yeah. At least a sentence or two, I think, should be written to convince me that there is no, why, why is it that this doesn't have reciprocal terms in z plus i and its expansion? Because you could have the situation where you have infinitely many reciprocal terms in one thing and infinitely many reciprocal terms in another thing, and yet the product has none at all. I mean, I'm saying the appearance of essential singularity. Let me show you. Let me show you. How about this? Let's 
if I can do it interestingly. Uh, Uh, trying to think of something. I'm not sure I'm going to get it. 1 plus 1 over z. 1 over z squared. 1 over z cubed. Um... Oh, curses. I can't, I can't think of the example. The same. Th well, I, this is not quite as, as greedy as I want, but this is not what I want, but it, it illustrates the idea. I mean, So this, this gives us but I, if I had more time and was more clever, um, I could give you an example of two essential singular series which which cancel. Oh, an easy way to create it. What I should have done, what I should have done, guys, is I should have just done like e to the 1 over z times e to the minus 1 over z. So we have like 1 plus 1 over z minus 1 over z squared times 2 times 1 minus 1 over z plus, it's not a minus there. Um, multiply those out, you should get one. Now, th this one up here, you got you, <laughs> the way I created that is with one over one minus one over z. So of course that <laughs> times one minus one over z <laughs> is equal to one, of course. I like to do this example in calculus too, but with like the geometric series, it's kind of like, whoa, how's that infinite series just multiply out to give something finite? Well, it's not surprising really. If you know the man behind the curtain. So my point, my larger point is just because you have an essential singularity, the appearance of an essential singularity doesn't mean that it's actually one. So, you know, but that won't happen here. If you, get, if you dig into the details, you can prove that this is in fact analytic at minus i, and that's analytic at i. And as such, it has no reciprocal terms in the vice versa of the singularity points that we're looking at. But maybe the kasparati weierstrass theorem is a way to get a more satisfyingly concrete proof. I don't know. Other questions? No? The, oh, the, the sum of, the sum of, yeah. the sum of, the sum of natural numbers. <laughs> Oh. Okay. 
If you guys have any questions about these, or oh, okay. Well, just this one is actually what I'm inviting you guys to do is to, to basically derive the binomial series result. So you, you'll, I mean, this is actually for for a complex power, but in a specific case that you know alpha is real, that's the usual binomial series from like Calc two, and so it's. Relatively simple to work out, um, but yeah, not that bad. Um, no. Yeah. So the the proof that the sum of the natural numbers is minus one twelve. That that is people being cute. Oh, it's totally not allowed. They're just like, yeah. oh, let's just shift this over one. And then right. I, thought, I mean, the. I thought it was garbage. So. I didn't think it was cute. Funny. <laughs> I was like, well. This is rad. Well. Essentially, the point is this: if you, you can define the Riemann the Riemann zeta function, to be the sum. <laughs> and, I've never heard it said out loud, so I just thought it was pronounced right. <laughs> the rhyme, the rhyme, the Riemann zeta. The, the Riemann zeta function. <laughs> the, the, it's the Riemann zeta function. <laughs> no. So, so we, we prove, we prove in calculus two, that this converges. This is the p series with p equals s, and you are probably maybe you recall that if p is um, greater than one, so if s equals to p is greater than one, then you know, zeta of s is a real number, right? And, but you can extend, so that by the principle of permanence of identity from complex analysis, since that, then since that's true, in fact, for s, the real part of s being greater than one, you can, through some fairly simple arguments, show that the zeta function is um, analytic, or if you like, holomorphic, for the real part of S greater than 1. Then, if you do this kind of sneaky integration by parts, you can extend, you can extend the, um, the formula back to here. And you can, you, can, you can keep extending it, such that it picks up poles like that. Yeah. It picks up poles like that. Okay. And then if you look at the extension, the analytic continuation of the Riemann zeta function, mm -hmm. and you plug in s equals to minus 1, um, plug in s equal to minus 1, then the analytic continuation gives you minus 112. So it's not the zeta function directly that gives you minus 112. It's like the analytic continuation of the thing or something like that. This is roughly the story. I may be, I may be, I may be messing up part of it. If you want the finer points, you should ask Dr. Smith. He knows this stuff wow, that deeply. Makes so much sense why. Because I know there's something like related that is important that's actually true. Yeah. It, it, is, it is people being cute with something that's actually important and interesting. It's much like this. If I had f of x is equal to x minus 3 over x minus 3, right? And then I was like, oh, well, f of 3 is equal to 3 minus 3 over 3 minus 3. Or actually, let me do it this way. I messed it up. f of x is x minus 3 over x minus 3. So that's equal to 1. So then f of 3 is equal to 3 minus 3 over 3 minus 3 which is equal to 0 over 0, but hey, it's also equal to 1. So look, 0 over 0 is equal to 1. <laughs>